Right. Hello, everybody. Uh, my name's Steve Cushion. I'm uh, one of the conveners of uh, this UCL Institute of the Americas seminar series, uh, uh, along with my fellow conveners, uh, Kate Quinn and Gad Human. Uh, today, we're, uh, we've, we have from Trinidad, from San Fernando, as we were discussing earlier, we have uh, uh, Ozzy Warwick, uh, who's uh, a, a leading trade unionist in Trinidad and Tobago. Uh, he is Education and Research Officer uh, of the Oilfield Workers Trade Union. Uh, he is the Secretary of the Joint Trade Union Movement and uh, General Secretary of the Movement for Social Justice. He holds a Bachelor of Law degree and an LLM, Masters of Law, with a specialisation in law and development from the University of London, as well as postgraduate certificate in human rights law and, and a postgraduate diploma in economic regulations. Uh, so uh, it's, uh, it's, a, uh, it's a great pleasure to, for us today, for Ozzy will be talking about uh, industrial relations in the Caribbean. Uh, and uh, uh, I think uh, uh, few better to uh, few better to discuss the matter. So over to you, Ozzy, and welcome. Yeah, well, thanks a, a lot, Steve, and really thanks to the UCL Institute of the Americas. Thanks a lot, Kate and, and Garth, for having this session and for having me here uh, this afternoon. Now, I don't know, Steve, um, how much you would have planned this because today is a very special day. Today is the 13th of March. It is the 45th anniversary of the Grenadian Revolution. It was on this day, 45 years ago, 13th of March, 1979, that the New Jewel Movement seized power and ushered in the People's Revolution. So it's really an honor for me to, to do this presentation. And I'm sort of doing this presentation uh, with that in mind as a form of recognition of the Grenada Revolution. And yes, I am speaking to you all from Trinidad and Tobago where it is nice and sunny um, as compared to, I'm sure what you all are experiencing in, in the UK. Um, I want to be clear of the perspective that I am coming from when looking at industrial relations in the Caribbean. I'm not coming from the neo pluralist or unitarist perspective. I am coming from the Caribbean radical tradition of Fanon, Rodney, Bishop, and C.L.R. James. That means that when I'm thinking of industrial relations, I am thinking of the nature of capitalist society, where there's a fundamental division of interest between capital and labor, which is the background for workplace relations. Now, I'm aware that the industrial relations literature suggests some kind of natural movement from the antagonistic, confrontational, and adversarial collective bargaining towards a more cooperative, collaborative, and consensual one, which will end with a collective agreement or partnerships within the framework of what the ILO called social dialogue. However, I want to suggest that this movement is not as seamless as some may want to make it out to be, and it certainly is not natural. I, I therefore think that from a Caribbean perspective, industrial relations is a lot more dynamic and it is rooted in class struggle. I wanna suggest that the field of industrial relations in the Caribbean has its origins in the theater of the plantation and the plantation economy and set the stage for what would become persistent class struggle. Now, by the early 18th century, Britain had emerged as the leading colonial power in the Caribbean. And they brought a sort of new dimension to the exploitation of the natural resources and labor. This was its concentration on organized sugar production with a close link between the plantocracy and the colonial government. This was a sharp distinction, rather there was a sharp distinction between the managers of those plantations who through their control of capital monopolized the economic and political power on one side, and then the workers who lived and work in absolute servitude. And I want to speak to this relationship as it will become relevant in terms of modern and Caribbean industrial relations. In other words, I want to draw a clear line between the plantation and the relations on the plantation 
with modern Caribbean industrial relations. And one of the key relationships was not the owner and the enslaved, but I want to speak of the role of the overseer, whose task was to ensure profitability whilst keeping the workers or the enslaved in line and discipline. Which role, I wish to argue, can now be found in today's human resource and industrial relations managers. The treatment of labor issues in the post-emancipation era now has also found itself alive and well in the modern Caribbean state. And so the tendency of the Caribbean state to drift towards the colonial state approach to labor was only tempered really by the workers themselves, more specifically the mass movement. Because it was the existence of a strong mass movement that kept the state in check. Therefore, weakening the mass movement will have a direct impact on industrial relations, enabling the state to indeed drift more and more towards a colonial power structure and human resource and industrial relations practitioners to drift more and more towards that of an overseer. Now, remember, the treatment of the slaves was left to the purview of the planter. And I'll, and I'll come back to that to show the dimensions of that finding remnants of it even within today's modern industrial relations landscape. The state did not intervene for the protection of slaves, but rather focus on the property rights of the planters. So colonial industrial relations really played itself out completely on the plantation. Industrial relations in the Caribbean were therefore shaped by the authoritarian nature of social relations with the plantocracy in a position of control and dominate the way in which labor issues were dealt with in major industries and enterprises. And this now was further facilitated by the colonial state, which provided a supporting role for the plantocracy to do as they feel, making the life of the slave and later in the post-emancipation era, the estate laborer, that life would become characterized by poverty, hardship, misery. I mean, the question is, what is the life of the worker in the modern Caribbean state? Then in the late 19th century, labor in the Caribbean would begin to politically organize itself in organizations with socialist roots like the Trinidad Working Men's Association, which was established in 1897. And interestingly enough, there was a strong connection between the early labor organizations and the British Labor Party. It was strong. There was this strong working class identity and a deep class consciousness. Caribbean industrial relations then became dominated by these early labor organizations like the TWA uh, that challenged employers and the colonial state and led the mass movement to the general strike of 1919 in, in Trinidad and Tobago, which resulted in the end of Crown Colony rule, which would be direct rule, to a limited democracy with a legislative council. So Caribbean workers, as a sort of new historical category, as CLR would explain, built a mass movement that confronted capital and colonialism in the Caribbean. Two things should be noted at this stage. One is the self-organization of the working class. And two, that industrial relations and political struggle were not separated. They, there were no distinction as it is today. Now with the capitalist crisis of the late 1920s, early 30s, there were calls across the Caribbean for the colonial authority to introduce a trade union bill. However, when the colonial authority brought a bill to the colonies, that bill made no provision for peaceful picketing and immunity for actions in tort, as well as it made no provisions for funds for political purpose. So the bill that would have been introduced to the different local legislative councils across the Caribbean were actually different from what would have been the Trade Disputes Act of 1906, which was introduced into the, in, into, in, in Britain which gave the right to strike. That did not happen for the colonies. The conditions 
and deeply unequal social relations coupled with the racism under the colonial system persisted into the 30s and provoked what became a massive labor and social upheavals, upheaval. Some people refer to it, this would have been 1934 is when it really started to uh, germinate, but it exploded in 1937. Some people call it labor riots. Some people call it revolt. Some people consider it to be a full rebellion. And this upheaval, the social of labor and social upheaval took place across the British Caribbean. The demands of better working and living conditions, as well as political demands, such as independence and the right to vote, again, showed no distinction between industrial relations and political struggle. In response to that, the British government appointed the Foster Commission in 1937 to investigate the disturbances in Trinidad and Tobago and Moyne Commission in 1938 to investigate and report on the general labor and social conditions in the West Indies. And, and you'll begin to see where things started to change a bit because the commission recommended a new framework for industrial relations as the conditions were such that the workers were virtually unprotected but more importantly was the deep-seated fear that those revolts had the potential to be transformed into a full-fledged revolution. One of the recommendations of the Moyne Commission, for example, resulted in the enactment of a number of labor acts, which also established labor departments in the different territories. And here's the mandate that these labor departments had to promote industrial peace, to regulate relations between workers, trade unions, and employers. So that <clears throat> I'm, I'm saying that the foundations for the current <clears throat> industrial relations systems were firmly established then. And that these labor acts <clears throat> were intended to mediate the class struggle and subdue the agitation. And especially the, the agitation of the laboring masses. And what will evolve would be our or what evolved from that coming out of that foundation would be our contemporary labor law. This epic challenge to colonial rule meant that empire would not be able to hold on to its West Indian colonies. The confrontation between the West Indian with between West Indian labor and the upcoming bourgeois class was intensifying. Their independence was going to be inevitable, but clearly there was this need to put in place the mechanism or mechanisms and conditions that can ensure that the relationship between labor and capital is not only mediated, but that capital can be guaranteed full legal protection and the policy infrastructure to enable it to continue to extract the surplus value. The newly independent Caribbean countries, it, start, it would have been started in Trinidad and Tobago and Jamaica in 62, Barbados in 66, and then the others came a little later in terms of the uh, what we call the OECS. Those would be the Eastern Caribbean states like uh, St. Lucia, uh, Grenada, St. Vincent, etc. So these uh, newly independent Caribbean countries found themselves, however, in a neo-colonial relations and therefore had the difficulty of delivering on the aspirations of what independence was meant. It was clear, however, that critical was the creation of an industrial relations landscape that saw the taming of labor placing workers in a weaker position. So the state now became an instrument for regulating relations in favor of capital, even, even as it sought to codify the protection of workers' rights through laws. However, voluntarism remained a dominant form of in industrial relations 
in, in, in the Caribbean, right? The tradition of uh, volunteerism in industrial relations, which enabled the trade unions and employers to regulate their own relations without interference from public authorities. This is the same way the plantation plantations were left to regulate their own relations. However, as workers exerted more and more power over private capital, the newly independent states found it necessary to curb this power. And so you begin to see significant deviations from the voluntary tradition of industrial relations. Now, this is twofold. As um, I'm aware that there is an argument that it was necessary for state intervention as employers were not recognizing unions. But my argument is that the non-recognition of unions was leading to industrial instability. And it is this instability that they wanted to address and not so much legal protection of workers. It is the instability that was arising out of the previous uh, volunteeristic um, tradition. It is crucial to remember that the contradictory objectives of the state are to maintain the accumulation of capital whilst legitimating the capitalist system of production in the Caribbean. And that legitimizing was necessary for industrial stability. And why was this? From very early after independence, as I indicated earlier, the these newly um, independent states was, was really finding it difficult to deliver on the independence aspirations of the laboring masses, of the, mass, the, the masses of, 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 of West Indian uh, people. Um, and therefore, there was, there, was, there was a huge amount of confrontations. Uh, in Trinidad and Tobago, for example, there were strikes all across the country. And that gave rise now, because remember, Trinidad and Tobago became independent in 62. That gave rise now to a strong legalistic system with the introduction of the Industrial Stabilization Act in 1965. That's just three years after in, uh, independence. And the subsequent arrest of several trade union leaders. In Jamaica, just uh, about six years after their independence in 62, you have the major Rodney riots, which took place. And then two years later, in 1970, you had the Black Power Revolution, and you had an armed struggle that was taking place in Trinidad and Tobago. These post-independent antagonisms culminated with the Grenada Revolution. Grenada became independent in 1974 and was led by Eric Gehry. And as I mentioned at the top of this talk, today is the 45th anniversary of the Grenada Revolution. What did the, what did the revolutionary, People's Revolutionary Government, as they were called, PRG, formed by the New Jewel Movement, what did they, or what was, would have been their contribution to the industrial relations landscape? First, the, you had the anti-worker laws like the 1974 Public Order Amendment Act. You had the 1975 Newspapers uh, Amendment Act. And you had the Essential Service Act of 1978, which, which prohibited industrial action. First of all, they, all of these uh, pieces of anti-worker legislation were repealed just after the revolution. And they passed a what became known as the People Law Number no. Twenty Nine, which is the Trade Union Recognition Law. So, for the first time in Grenada, workers had the opportunity to join the uh, a trade union, and the employers were compelled to recognize the trade union once fifty one percent of the workforce were financial. They also passed the Maternity Leave Law in nineteen far back in nineteen eighty. Uh, they also passed the Equal Pay for Equal Work Decree in the state sector. Uh, other key pieces of legislation included uh, rent control law and 
a new Workmen Compensation Act. So the revolution ensured that the rights of working people were protected by making it compulsory for employers to recognize trade unions of, uh, of, of the workers' choice. And the labor legislations, um, other pieces of legislation that would have been passed by the new dual movement were some, actually some of the most advanced in our region, which would influence the 1997 Employment Act in Grenada. In other words, it, they democratized industrial relations. Uh, the government also, uh, the People's Revolutionary Government also protected workers in their old age. They established a national insurance scheme among other social security initiatives, which became a model for the development of, of social security and life support infrastructure, a model which many other uh, Caribbean uh, countries uh, implemented the tragic end of the revolution in 1983 with the brutal assassination of Maurice Bishop and several uh, cabinet members coincided with a new epoch in human history, and that was the rise of neoliberalism. So this now brings me to Caribbean industrial relations in the era of neoliberalism. Caribbean is not isolated or is not apart from, but it is integrated into the global economic system. And therefore, it, there would have been a significant impact of neoliberalism on Caribbean society, and in particular, Caribbean industrial relations. One of the things that would emerge in the in this era of neoliberalism was the confrontation between the new emerging industrial relations professionals with the radical trade union tradition in, in the Caribbean. And there would have been a, a lot of workplace conflicts and confrontations. You see, the emergence of human resource and industrial relations programs, like those offered at the University of the West Indies Arthur Lockjack Masters in HR program, they sought to shift industrial relations practice to more this, to human resource management. And as a result, you found that employers started to rely more and more on attorneys. So industrial relations started to become extremely legalistic. So for example, 15 to 20 years ago, you would have at the industrial court, because of the nature of the court and so on, a trade union officer representing the union and the workers, and you would have an industrial relations officer representing the company, making their case, their evidence and arguments, et cetera, before the court. That has changed. You go to the industrial court now as, as attorneys. So it has become extremely legalistic. And you see more and more a dependence not on the shop floor struggle, which brings out the class struggle definitively. But what you see now is a lot of workplace grievances and issues being um, dealt with at the, at the court, right? Or at the ministry. Employers, also started to use new strategies in, in, the, in the neoliberal era where they deliberately violated the collective agreements with impunity. And the idea behind doing that is to create what is called custom and practice. So if they violate a particular clause long enough and often enough, it becomes very difficult for the union to enforce that particular clause. They also closed companies that had strong collective agreements with a, a, um, decent terms and conditions. They dragged out grievances and collective bargaining. They refused to fill vacancies, relying more and more on precarious workers or contract work. Plus, every time a trade union goes for recognition, once a recognition certificate is um, is given, the employers would challenge that in, a, in, in, in the high court. They would file for judicial review of the 
certificate. The, the latest strategy has been one where the employers challenge in the court who can be considered a worker. So what in fact they're doing is narrowing the definition of a worker so that less and less workers can be represented by unions. Because as I indicated, a lot of it has become now the entire industry, almost the entire industrial relations uh, landscape was started to be governed by legislation. So it is, and in that legislation, there was a definition of who is a worker. And now employers are challenging that. Another neoliberal model, one that is prevalent in the oil and gas sector, but has also been utilized more and more in other sectors, including the service sector, um, is one where you have, for example, a multinational company. The multinational company will then contract out to a drilling company, which then contract a labor supply contractor. And the reason why that model um, affects the industrial relations landscape is because there is a question as to who the employer is. All right, so it therefore weakens the ability of the trade unions to represent the workers or in, or if you look flipping the other way around, it makes it more difficult for a worker to be represented or to engage in collective bargaining. And if is if that is not bad enough, we have seen a proliferation of what you could call the Uber model, where the workers are now being defined as independent contractors. The point is that these shifts are really manifestations of the changing balance of power and force. And I want to state that power is what lies at the heart of industrial relations. Yet, interestingly, not much is done to research this area in terms of power, the power relations itself. And many contemporary relations specialists, industrial relations specialists, seem to stay away from that. And maybe it's because <clears throat> Once we start talking about power, we'll be forced to acknowledge <coughs> class relations and class struggle within the industrial relations paradigm. Now, <coughs> when thinking about the current state of affairs of industrial relations in the Caribbean, um, we have to look particularly at the right to strike and collective bargaining. So whilst countries have ratified the fundamental ILO conventions <clears throat> on the, um, and, and as well as the fundamental freedom of association, um, which is enshrined in the constitutions of many of the Caribbean countries, there are severe limitations on the fundamental right to strike. <clears throat> and there are restrictions with respect to what the state calls the objective of a strike. In fact, there are even restrictions with respect to the type of strike. Now, in terms of the balance of forces and power, the authorities and employers have the power to unilaterally prohibit, limit, suspend, even cease a, stri a strike action. They also have the power to prevent or end a strike by referring the dispute to conciliation. When workers do take strike action, that state considers, that the state considers unauthorized, they impose excessive penalties for the workers and the unions. There's even um, not just a limitation, but an outright ban on strikes in certain sectors, what they call essential services. Now, just to give even some more specific examples. So in Trinidad and Tobago, the government refuses to reform labor legislation and continue to refuse to reform the law on essential service, which I just mentioned. So there are groups of workers who fall under this uh, essential service uh, sectors who are denied or prohibited from taking in industrial action, which is inconsistent with even the ILO minimum standards. Um, Many unions, collective bargaining efforts have been blocked by employers uh, delaying tactics. The state itself repeatedly refused to negotiate collective agreements with public sector unions. 
And although the law states that workers can form and join trade unions, in practice, persons such as domestic workers, drivers, gardeners, etc., they are not even recognized as workers and therefore cannot legally join unions. The problems with obtaining a union recognition continues owing to the uh, manipulation of, uh, by the state. Um, despite the many formalities and restrictions on the right to strike, however, a number of unions did call work stoppages in, in several sectors, as they have done over the last few years. In some cases, when that happens, the state intervened to stop the strike via injunction from the court and, of course, penalizing the workers involved. Now, very recently, as, as, as recent as last week, Thursday, in response to the postal workers and port workers threatening strike action, an editorial came out. And here's the title of the editorial the penalties of illegal strike action. So there you see this uh, continuous attempt and that editorial, mind you, was written by an, guess who? Yeah, an industrial relations specialist. So you see that continued attempt really to tame labor, to curtail workers' ability to exercise power. In Barbados, now the government neither supports nor guarantees collective bargaining. Given the absence of any legal requirements, collective bargaining is only practiced where there is good where there is a goodwill between the parties or a tradition of such uh, negotiations. Uh, the national legislation only permits the representation of employees a certain amount of over a certain amount, and um, Barbados has what some view as the social partnership model which has been showcased as a best practice uh, but notwithstanding that just last month month end, um, end of january beginning of february the university of the west indies workers kfl campus they took strike action um, which led to their victory in jamaica industrial relations were regulated primarily through the uh, labor relations and industrial dispute act 1975 and its subsequent amendments and what happened is that by creating an industrial disputes tribunal, the LRIDA opened the way for massive, unprecedented legal intervention in industrial relations. This uh, is particularly true of industrial action, specifically, of course, <coughs> strike. <coughs> However, that did not stop workers from taking a series of strike action against the wholeness government in 2022. And just last year, July, <clears throat> More than 2,000 workers of state-owned National Water Commission issued notice of strike. A major battlefront that is going to emerge uh, that we need to pay attention to is Guyana, with its discovery of vast oil and gas reserve. It will be interesting to see how the Guyana workers and trade unions respond to this dramatic change in its economy. Will they be able to assert influence and therefore make significant gains for the workers? Or will inequality and inequity, inequity be further deepened? Whilst the new oil and gas sectors remain remains largely ununionized, we have seen, however, some major industrial action taken by teachers and the Guyana Teachers Union, which took strike action, which lasted just over a month and only ended last week. We cannot escape the fact that the relationship between worker and employer is an antagonistic one, so long as the relationship is built on exploitation, i.e. the extraction of surplus value. Therefore, I will emphasize that the relationship is one of class struggle. Class struggle raises con uh, class consciousness and class, uh, and class conscious workers challenges the status quo, including the industrial relations principle of management prerogative. I wanted to end this talk by talking, uh, by looking at some political options for a paradigm shift in the industrial relations in the Caribbean. The paradigm shift is grounded in the power, in power and balance of forces. So how can workers exercise power and how can they build a strong force? 
the industrial relations of the Caribbean is constructed in practice on foundations set during the colonial period. It is meant to be a mediating framework that lessens worker co workers' consciousness to shift the balance of power from workers. There can be no doubt about the role of the state in facilitating the shift, but it is necessary to distinguish the state as a facilitating mechanism and industrial relations as a mediating condition. So we have this contradiction because on the surface, there's an appearance of strong workers' protection, and therefore the balance of power would appear to be with workers. Indeed, as I said before, Caribbean countries have ratified a majority of the fundamental ILO conventions, including, and the freedom of association is enshrined in most Caribbean territories. Um, yet, it is obvious that at the same time, as the Caribbean government ratified these conventions, they were not yet brought into law and further below the surface, what we see is that it's right and undermine trade unions. So what are the political options? I divide, I divide the options into two main tendencies, moderate fosterite tendency. I, I, we call it fosterite because it's named after the foster commission, which was established in 1937 that called for something called what they term as responsible trade unionism. Within that tendency, what you look, what we look at is the social compact or partnership model. There is where unions participate fully in a tripartite process or mechanism. In this approach, unions push for greater involvement in national development mechanisms as equal partners. There's all, this is also applicable at the regional level when we consider the Caribbean community or CARICOM. For this to work, however, it's very important that we educate and sensitize the partners and that the public, the masses, the laboring class itself um, also needs to be sensitized and the need now to also establish a proper functioning secretariat. Another aspect within that tendency is amendments to the labor laws. And this is where, this, is, this approach is where unions develop a strategy for a sustained campaign for amendment of the labor laws. I place this as a moderate political option, but it does have the potential, if successful, in the amendment to the laws, especially the one on recognition and right to strike, um, stronger penalties for employers uh, who fail to meet and treat, that has the potential to become even a more radical uh, political option. Harmonization of labor laws. Harmonization of these said laws would be- Jamie, uh, you want to take me to the Jimon that we can? Uh, harmonization of these law said laws would be consistent with a regional approach, as this will not only strengthen workers' representations at the national level, but also at the regional level. As I said, these moderate approaches can lead to the more radical approach. So now I turn to what I term the radical Butlerite option, named after Uriah Butler, one of the leaders of the 1937 revolt, who politically challenged the colonial authority through direct mass action and with a view of workers holding actual power. One of the political options for labor is to take the lead in the climate crisis and just transition discourse by advancing the public pathway approach to ensure a truly transformative just transition in response to the climate crisis. That's an important uh, political role. Oh, secondly, we have to deepen and widen Caribbean labor history beyond technical training of grievance procedures and labor law, which brings me to the Cipriani College of Labor, which needs to become a leading progressive labor institution, not just a labor institution, a progressive labor institution, so that the Caribbean, uh, the Cipriani College of Labor has to make critical political economy and radical social theory compulsory for all of its students, regardless of their area of studies, in order to distinguish it from the more the other sort of bourgeois institutions that are uh, given rise to a whole range of IR and HR uh, professionals. Another political option is for the trade unions to build a clear regional labor platform that can run parallel to existing political parties. In other words, the political parties will not be the only political formation. Parties vying for power will have to develop and implement programs that are consistent with the labor platform. 
Uh, finally, there is the political option of building and strengthening the mass movement to create a broad labor front that includes trade unions, civil society organizations, NGOs, and communities, which can assert participatory political power and influence intensifying the class struggle, which has the potential to lead labor into holding the reins of power. Now, there is a song that we sing at, at, at all union, if, uh, unions, if, uh, union events. And it says, let labor hold the reins of power. I would like to be in that number when labor holds the reins of power. How to actualize, now when I use the term labor, I, am, I'm, I just want to distinguish because the audience that I'm speaking to, I'm not talking about the labor party in the UK. When I speak of labor here, I'm speaking primarily of the mass movement in, in, in the Caribbean. So how to actualize labor holding the reins of power is a serious question, but it certainly will be a serious paradigm shift in industrial relations. As I, I conclude, I would like to state that industrial relations in the Caribbean is a very dynamic, it's very dynamic with a long tradition and rich history. As the region grapple with the climate crisis, the crisis of capitalism and neoliberalism, the rapid uh, technological advancement, including artificial intelligence and so on, it would be really in the end dependent on the balance of forces and the strength of the mass movement led by organized labor that will determine three possible futures. One, Caribbean countries are able to respond to these issues in an atmosphere of industrial peace to the mutual benefit of labor and capital. Two, the complete capitulation of labor resulting in the Caribbean workers living a life of servitude and misery. And three, full-fledged revolt and revolution by the mass movement. The future is unpredictable. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ozzy. That was, uh, that was great. Uh, I, I must say, uh, as a trade unionist, I got a little depressed about halfway through your talk, uh, <laughs> but uh, 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 you cheered us all up at the end, uh, uh, if you <laughs> see what I mean. Uh, and yeah. the other thing I... The other thing I really thought was uh, uh, an element of the old saying, you know, that it's the same the old world over. I mean, we've seen the increasing legalization uh, of, uh, uh, mm. of 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 trade unionism uh, uh, and 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 so on, you know, to the uh, uh, increasing benefit of the employers. Uh, yeah. But uh, now, one thing that I would like to ask you about, if I may, uh, and can anyone else who wants to ask a question of, of Ozzy, please start putting your hands up. You can use the uh, uh, the reactions on the bottom row, uh, or you can write it in the chat if you don't wish to be seen, but uh, it is better if you do actually ask it yourself. Uh, but anyway, uh, the uh, uh, you said penalise workers. Now, I, I know uh, 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 as far as uh, uh, Britain's concerned, the law has concentrated on penalizing trade unions uh, of threatening the funds. They tried penalizing workers back in the 1970s when they arrested seven dockers and they got a, and they got a near general strike. Uh, and I think they've, they've learned from that. Uh, but so what are the penalties that that can apply to uh, uh, to workers uh, in uh, uh, particularly Trinidad? Uh, but because it, it, it seems to me that uh, 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 one thing that they've desperately tried to avoid here is having any martyrs that people will actually start to walk out and support. But uh, uh, tell me the situation there. Well, they were, the, the penalise the penalise workers in two ways. One, mass dismissals, like, for example, what happened with some of our workers working at the national um 
petroleum marketing company. That is the comp that is a state company that is responsible for fuel distribution. A group of our members, workers, took um, action, health and safety action, um, and they, they, they fired 68 of them, dismissed 68 of them. Um, and we fought that case and we won it. We won that case. Um, but for three years, these workers were outside. Um, so that has serious implications. So mass dismissals and, and this tendency to cut pay. Because you see, remember, we live in a world where, to be honest, most of our workers included, who are the, still some of the more decently paid workers, they still live more or less day to day, you know, trying to just make two ends meet. So one of these ways in which they penalize them is they will cut their pay for either a week's pay or even a month's pay. So those are two very concrete ways in which they penalize workers. The dismissals, however, that's, that is a really big trend, quick to dismiss. Thank you. Uh, Ray. You. Yes, thank you, I've unmuted. Um, thank you very much for that, Ozzy. Um, wonderful presentation. My question is about the relationship between power and what CI, um, CY Thomas calls the poor and the powerless. And you mentioned the Foster and the Moyne Commissions. I'm not familiar with the Foster Commission, but the Moyne Commission, I'm aware yeah. that its report highlighted the impoverished existence of the majority of people in the Caribbean. So my question really is, how does my generation, I was born in the mid 50s, how did my how does my generation get in a sense an awareness a consciousness of labor of our forebears in labor struggles because it was not part of the curriculum yeah and we continue to be yeah part of the poor and powerless because we've not joined into a movement grenada's had it guyana had it in the 1950s but coming through to the present day you'd be hard pushed to say that there's a continuum of labor consciousness in the masses in general? Yeah. You know, that's such a, a powerful question, Ray. Uh, and here's why. You know, <clears throat> the entire Caribbean society is built on this question of labor, right? Our entire political history is intertwined with the movement of labor. As I would have mentioned, the earliest political formations, which came out in the late um, 19th uh, century in 1897. But do you know, even before that, um, as far back as 1846, just after a emancipation, a group of workers, some 600 workers in Cuba, formed themselves, or already began to self-organize. And when you consider the role of labor in the in the his, in the political history of the caribbean i believe that there has been a deliberate attempt to silence that voice and that history it's almost as though the history of our caribbean is really only about these professional middle class who negotiated independence. And they are the new heroes. And therefore the professional middle class became the new heroes. Whereas the true heroes, the ordinary laboring class, the carpenters, the electricians, the mechanics, who are ordinary, just ordinary artisans and working people who actually self-organized, not even the professional middle class with that self-organized in the late, 1800s into the earlier part of the 20th century. It was ordinary working people. That history and the history of what led to the 1930s, 1930, 34, 35, 36, 37. But uh, it's completely white. It's not, it's absent, completely absent. I mean, you speak to any person now and ask them, if, the only reason they know Butler is because we have a highway named after him. So yeah. everybody travel on the you Butler Highway. Yeah. But they don't know that rich history. They don't know. And, and I think that this is my feeling as to why that is deliberately um, removed. And it has to do with something Walter Rodney said. Walter Rodney said that 
what is key to consciousness is having an appreciation for the historical role that your ancestors played in overcoming great challenges. And when you think about the fact that ordinary people in small islands challenged the British Empire in the 30s, yeah. that is huge. That and was in, huge. And in Haiti's case, succeeded. Oh, perhaps, and in Haiti's case, absolutely succeeded. Um, I mean, it, it is phenomenal, right? But they stripped that because I think it's a way of, of ensuring that the poor, ordinary people remain with a kind of... Uh, um, uh, remain in servitude. They remain in, you don't know that you are part of an incredible legacy of people who challenge the status quo, right? Mm -hmm. And the other thing, just to close off on that, the other thing that is that they're very silent about uh, um, the early labor movement in the Caribbean is that it was socialist. Yes, that is yes. the other reason that they, you know, it, the early labor leaders were extremely, uh, they, they were socialists. Mm -hmm. So I, th you know, that is a very a fundamental point because it, it has to do with our identity as West Indians, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. And asserting ourselves, not just the category of West Indians, but qualified mm -hmm. even deeper, where we as ordinary working people who come from ordinary working class families mm -hmm. have a becomes the subject of history and not the object of history. We create our own history. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Right. Uh, we have, uh, there's four people uh, in the queue. I'll start with uh, Gad. Uh, thanks. Ozzy, that was uh, really interesting. Uh, I, have a, I have a question for you, but I also have a little gripe. So, uh, not a major gripe, of course. Uh, it was really interesting. But you said that um, the lab labor in the Caribbean has not been treated well. I want to remind you about a book. I don't know if you can see this. It's called Labor in the Caribbean, and uh -huh. what, which I happen to be a co-editor a long time ago. <laughs> but uh, an essay in there, which I hope you're familiar with, was by no, no, I'm sadly the late Richard Hart. Mm -hmm. and, yes. he, and, he, and, and I hope you're familiar with it because he did talk about all these things. And he talked yeah. about he talked about this, the, the labor movement in the way you have, and you know he would have done that because I'm sure you know about him. So I just, I mean, I understand what you said about people's understanding. They didn't read this book. They didn't know who Richard Hart was, but we do, you do. Yeah. And a lot of people maybe listening do. So it's just that there is a consciousness, at least among those who have researched it, that it's there. That's, I would just yeah. bring that to your attention. Maybe you would disagree, but here's my, but that was just, I thought I would mention it because it's, it's, it's interesting. And I, and, and, and I thought your talk was fascinating. Uh, and the part of the, the question I really had to have to do with you, you mentioned labor's role in dealing with this terrible climate crisis that we have. And yeah. so I thought maybe it'd be worth, uh, slightly expanding on that, if you could. Okay. Uh, Steve, do you want me to answer it one by one, or we want to take a few of them and, and then I, I tackle them? Uh, How do you want to proceed? Uh, just uh, just answer this one, and then yeah, okay. I'll get the next three people, Joseph, Marissa, and Jeanette, to uh, yes. ask their questions uh, one at, uh, 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 as a block. But, uh, okay. but All right. Well, yeah, thanks a lot, Dad, for, um, for the observation. And I'm, I'm really happy that you did mention uh, Richard Hart because he's made a significant, mm. extremely significant contribution. And he's one of those that I was mentioning when I talk about the fact that there is this uh, uh, sort of silence on the, 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 the socialist Caribbean um, who continue to shape basically our West Indian identity. And I guess the point I really wanted to make is it's more about around the popular consciousness. So yes, yeah. of course, there will be people who will know of CLR, know of Fanon, know of Rodney and so on. But I'm just thinking, you know, when I walk down the street and I'm, or I'm in a taxi and I'm sitting down with three people, I could turn to them and if I ask them, they would have no clue, right? And I guess it's partly our responsibility, I suppose, as, as labor as well, because we can't expect the bourgeois state to do it for us, right? Um, so... Yeah, so yeah, it is something that we really 
we can't uh, take for granted. And it's worse now because people's attention has to be divided among so many different things, mm -hmm. especially, I mean, I, I, I was just mentioning you sit down in a taxi, but everybody's on the phone on the, looking at TikTok, right? Mm -hmm. So you had to somehow fit it into all of that. So, but I do appreciate um, your mention of, of Richard Hart. Um, yes, the question of climate crisis has to be taken on board seriously by labor has to be because the climate crisis is going to significantly affect the uh, affect workers i mean we in the caribbean it's an existential threat because in one go it just takes a major hurricane to to to, to set us back in terms of our economy, in terms of development. I mean, look what happened to Grenada some years ago when a massive hurricane passed, passed through. Antigua, same thing, right? And I, as labor, I guess I am putting it in the context of the role, the traditional role of labor. We were always at the forefront of reimagining the future for our region. And I'm suggesting that in this context, with regards to the climate crisis, we must not drop the ball. We must not and uh, obfuscate that traditional role. And we must be at the forefront of reimagining uh, uh, a, 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 a different region, because if we don't, what will happen is that... Oops. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. You will have one green club continuing the control of energy. And so you, 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 that's how we envision it. Now, just to share with you um, that I'm not just speaking uh, rhetorically. We at the OWTU are part of uh, making uh, of an initiative of putting, of developing and putting forward an alternative to what we call green structural adjustment so that we have something that is green, yes, but it's more... Um, grounded in uh the, in what we call the social economy for example some people call it eco socialism but <laughs> i would get into the term thanks very thanks very much for that thank you right we're now going to take three uh three contributions in a row first of all joseph then marissa and then jeanette so joseph first please yeah, thank you very much, Stephen. Thank you also, Ozzy, and excellent presentation. And I'm wondering if, if it's, it's the spirit of the revolution, Grenada revolution, that I've helped you to do it, because today is the 45th yeah. anniversary of the Grenada revolution. And some of the issues I... being discussed here are also being discussed in Grenada, even as I speak. Um, but the, let me, you mentioned the, the issue of climate. My experience with trade unions is that they have played little, little, and a little concern, it seems, and might have been also contributing to some aspect of climate deterioration, climate change, also by insisting on certain things uh, uh, for for workers without understanding that the climate is on fire. And I want to ask, in terms of you mentioned about the about the uh, hurricane. But we have a, 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 another phenomenon on the heat, which certainly is affecting workers and their well-being. Yeah. How are, what do you think is what do you think can be done to ensure that workers are not adversely affected by this new rate of heat that is now going away in a hurry, especially in the context of where there are governments yeah. and other multinationals are trying to come in more to have more uh, uh, business into the fossil fuel. Uh, industry. Yeah. Thank you, Joseph. Okay. Marissa? She's not unmuted. No, uh, I think your sound's not working very well. You are unmuted, but we can't hear you. Is there... Perhaps if you turn your screen, turn your, your picture off. Turn your video off. That might get some more, allow some more bandwidth. Have another go. Uh, 
no, I'm afraid we're not getting you uh, at all. I don't think anyone else is. It's not just me, is it? Uh, uh, no, I, I suggest, if you can, that if you write it into the chat, I will read out what you want to say. Meanwhile, uh, Jeanette, please. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. I, sorry, I'm trying to, I'm trying to show this book. Um, so just, just to say, um, I, you know, I, I so agree that uh, there's, my students have never heard of Richard Hart. Here's his book put out in 2012. I don't know if you can see it, a collection yeah. of essays, political activism. They have, a few years ago, I'm teaching a carbon history course. They had never even heard of Walter Rodney. And, and, and they were they were shocked and they were glad to, you know, this is tertiary level institution. They had yeah. not heard of Walter Rodney. And they were like, what? We haven't heard of Walter Rodney. And I know they, they you know, today they won't have heard of um, Richard Hart. I, I didn't have a question. So we, you, you'll decide if you'll allow me. I kind of had... <laughs> Two examples. One is about the teaching of, you know, Rodney Hart, et cetera, that, that that's not, doesn't seem to be happening. Mm -hmm. But I had two other examples of just from Jamaica, just, just to the impact on trade unionism and unity and, and, a, and a kind of mass movement of struggle and determination. And I just remember in, in the years when the, I, the IMF, was you know bringing all kind of pressure down on Jamaica, and and what started as a fairly strong trade trade union movement in the Michael Manley era of the you know the, the late the, the late seventies and after that, you know you had a couple of decades of IMF agreements where government just simply let go a lot of um, government workers. It impacted the power of unions, people not rushing to join a union, people feeling very nervous about talking about these things because they're nervous about their, their job. So that has had a, honestly, mm. a yeah. from the people of Jamaica. And I just want to mention one more little tiny example. In 2022, September it was, the Supreme Court here ruled that um, security guards were not contract workers. You know, that yes, was a huge... I, I, I'm, familiar, I'm familiar with that ruling, yes. Right, right. And, and wow, yet, right. and, and, and I, that was 2022, you know, and yet, I don't even know what has happened now. Um, one of the things the employers tried to do a year after, they were still trying to say to a lot of their, their security guards, okay, apply back for jobs. You know, and people were like, no, but we've worked with you for 20 years, 15 years, how many years? You're asking me to now apply back to the start at the bottom, you know. So the 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 employees are going through all kind of hoops. So mm -hmm. you know, I, I'm not sure if they have they have begun to really put in place the measures that the court ordered. Mm. I, I I don't know if that even yeah. really. <laughs> twenty two. Thank you, uh, uh, Ozzy. If you come back on yeah. that, I'll, I'll 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 read out Mar Marissa's question. Yeah, well, let me just um, respond, and then you, you could read out the question, because on the last point by uh, it's Comrade Jeanette, right? Yeah? Um, no, yeah. in fact, that, that particular case, let me just tell you, we, we there was an uh, industrial court symposium last year. The case had just, it had just, no, 2022, right, so it was last year. And the, the feature speaker was from Jamaica, and he, and the key, the core point had to do with that case. And in fact, to go even further, we had to, because I sit on the minimum wages board and we were now, we were just about to have a discussion around the security guard order. And we, I, I insisted that we interview that, I can't remember his name. He's a professor at, at, from out of um, Mona. I just can't remember his name right. It's not, it's not right there with me. And we did an interview with him where he went into detail about that case in order to make the case that we don't make the same mistake. So we had to put a kind of, to try to block it because you're right, that was a trend 
that that case was going to, I mean, it was just going to explode across the Caribbean. So yeah. it, it is, um, I'm really glad that you, you raised it. It's a very, it is a very serious case. It has serious implications. Um, I I'm think, I think if I recall, he did say that there are some discussions. They may challenge it. It may have, it may go to the Privy Council because of the, the implications are so serious. Yes, I think, thing, I think they're, they're, I won't be surprised if that happens. Yes, I think that's what he said. They were looking at um, going there. Um, the other point you made, I, I, you know, I don't want, it's not to take it for granted. You see this deliberate attempt to completely erase, that's what I was looking for, erase from the history of our region, the role of people like Walter Rodney, Maurice Bishop, Richard Hart. I mean, we list can go on. I mean, if you really think about it, even at the level of the University of the West Indies, it's not there. It's mm. just not there. And what is scary for me, it's not even there at the Cipriani College of Labor. So one of the things we're fighting for is for the Cipriani College of Labor to ensure that at least every student in that space, because that's a labor college, understands labor history, but not, not understand history in a bourgeois sense, but understand labor history in the in our own Caribbean radical sense, the way Rodney analyzed how Europe underdeveloped Africa and so on. So we have our tools that we can use. Um, Richard Hart and his contribution and the methodologies, we have it, it can be used. The thing about the um, climate crisis really is a serious thing. Now, we are working very actively to really change labor's attitude on the, on the climate crisis. We're trying to put together, um, in fact, just up to two weeks ago, I spoke to the president of the Caribbean Congress of Labor, and, uh, Comrade Andre Lewis, to try to get the Caribbean Congress of Labor to take a position. And the position that we want to take is what is called the public pathway approach to the just transition. I think one of the struggles, some of the, the what I, I think one of the problems some of the, uh, the labor was having was finding, okay, we are going, we can, the bottom line is that we can lose a lot of work, workers would lose their jobs. But I think if we can change it around to say, no, we, we don't have to be defensive. We do not have to be um, just simply trying to defend jobs. We can actually, as Caribbean labor, articulate an alternative to the neoliberal um, just transition. So I think that um, that is critical. The, the, the point you made about the heat, you know, that is one of the ways <coughs> or the entry points to really to get labor to start to think about crisis, right? About the climate crisis, because our members are going to start to complain, especially where we have workers who are working outside. So already, one of the things we're trying to put together is a training for officers and shop stewards in terms of collectively bargaining for provisions under the under health and safety but again <coughs> that is um, a symptom of the wider issue of how do we manage the energy transition and how do we when we manage the energy transition that the caribbean do not begin to suffer from energy poverty meaning that it's only a few elite people have access to green energy while the majority of population when the majority of the population don't as a result of either affordability or accessibility due to uh, the production and distribution and transmission. Yeah, sorry, Steve. Yeah, okay. I, I, right. it, no, I, that was that, that was that was uh, that is important. I mean, I know you and I have discussed uh, the question of uh, uh, what is meant by a just transition, and I, you've used. You, you started talking of a real just transition and yeah. uh, uh, and I, I thought of the, the idea of adjective inflation, you know, that uh, you know, a real genuine just transition uh, and so on. But it is the way and someone has mentioned in the chat about how climate change sounds a lot less uh, threatening than global warming, for instance. Uh, yeah. And, yeah, and the way terminology is used yeah, yeah. and the way Correct. they steal our terms, as it were, and, and do that. I'm going to read our this. terms. Yeah, uh, I'm going to read. Uh, uh, I'm going to read your minister's question, uh, uh, and then if you answer that, and then Kate can come in. Yeah, if that's all right. Thank you for the fascinating talk. 
you talked about there being a continuation of forms of power relations between capital and labor from the time of the plantocracy to the uh, 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 to the transition to a more industrial stroke oil economy do you see them uh, uh, there may also be important differences thank you okay um well yeah i mean there will be differences in terms of just in the nature of how you exploit oil and gas so for example in the uh, uh, when we had the plantations everyone would have been concentrated on the plantation geographically right whereas with the exploration of oil and gas we have people who would be at the refinery you would have people out on the fields you'll have people offshore so it's it's a much it's much more it's not as geographically concentrated um so that that will be a uh, a difference but to me those differences honestly are not are a bit it's not fundamentally different let me, let me put it that way it is not fundamentally different because as a practicing um trade unionist when i when you sit in on the table the, just the way you you hear this speak it is an, an assertion of power over the workers. And it is about controlling. Of course, I would not suggest that life on the plantation is exactly the same as now. I'm, I'm not suggesting that. I'm just saying that the fundamental power relations is, to me, has remained intact. It has remained intact. And there have been moments when we when we challenge it, when workers challenge it, and that is in the time of um, huge antagonism and confrontation, and capital recognizing that potency is my my argument is that capital recognizing that potency has attempted by shifting the language from class struggle to industrial relations. Is it's really like what the bourgeois economists did with the labor theory of value to now the marginalist theory of value, because they knew that the labor theory of value was too politically potent. So now, when you you don't want to hear class struggle, it's now human resource management. It's now industrial relations. It's grievance procedure. You know, so um, I, I believe that there continues to be a form of power structure that is simply about extracting the surplus value of labor at any cost, at any cost. And everything else is just an adaptation to technological advancement and geography. But at the heart, it is still a commodity producing society which is built on exploiting labor by extracting the surplus value. That has not changed. And therefore the power structures around that remains intact. I don't know if I made any sense. What is that? Um, Thank you. Yep. Uh, I'm say ask a hard question, eh? I'll just say. <laughs> <laughs> right, uh, Kate, uh, next. Thank you very much for that talk, Ozzy. That was great, it was a real uh, tour de force. Um, You've spoken of the division between capital and labor, and I was wondering if I could push you a bit more on um, potential divisions within the labor movement. And I was thinking one of whether um, there are still partisan divisions between um, trade unions that might, you know, historically there were trade unions who were sort of affiliated or, you know, at least linked with one party or another, and whether those partisan divisions are still apparent in the landscape of trade unionism in the region today, and that, that that's one um, uh, obstacle to overcome in this this um, proposal for a you know a broad um, labour front is how strong partisan affiliations might be, party political ones, and then the other one is the role of the trade union leadership and whether. It has always played a progressive or a or a regressive um, role, and here I'm thinking of yeah the scholarship by Nigel Bolland and so on, and the way that he characterised some trade unions historically again because I don't know about the contemporary scene, but as having 
either charismatic authoritarian leaders, like he put Bustamante in that category, and then he had described ones as like having bureaucratic authoritarian structures. So the kind of ways in which middle class leaderships or other um, the kind of um, one man leaderships like Bustamante were um, another way of dampening those radical energies of the, the rank and file that you spoke about to, to channel things into more sort of acceptable forms of um, trade unionism and whether if you look around the landscape today, do you find that there's like a very technocratic leadership that is able to deal with this new way of neoliberal, legalistic, court-based ways of dealing with oh, labour okay. struggles? Um, yeah. Whereas um, I can see, like, you're in the Caribbean radical tradition, but uh, how many comrades do you have out there at the leadership strata of the, in the rest of the, the region? Yeah. All right, yeah. <laughs> okay. First of all, let me just say, Steve, you should have warned me that my audience was going to ask very hard questions. Yeah. You should have at least, so I could have psychologically prepared. <laughs> well, there's such very, very good questions. So let me go. Um, you are correct, Kate. Let us deal with the divisions within the labor movement. And I place them in three categories. One, ideological divisions. That would be trade unions who are more left, who are radical, who are who, and when I say radical, let me be even, let me qualify it and be clear what I mean. It means trade unionists or butlerite trade unionists who believe that there has to be a working class, work, the working class must hold power and transform the relations of power, economic power, political power, um, creating a more participatory democracy in our, in our, in our societies, right? To give communities more voice, um, give ordinary workers more voice. And then there are those who just are very happy with the status quo. And it's just a question of, you know, making a deal. Let's, let's be frank. Um, so that's ideological. Second is race. Let's, you know, in the, and I will speak specifically of Trinidad and Tobago and Guyana. We have that added problem of the uh, division based on uh, the vision of the two main ethnic groups. Even though these two groups belong to the laboring classes, those groups are divided by race, right? Mm -hmm. Well, I could say, let me say race slash religion slash geography, okay? That is a real uh, difficulty that we have to overcome. It is real and I would not pretend that it isn't. And that leads me to the third part, which is the one you really alluded to, which was a uh, party, party uh, partisan which means pull, um, trade unions that are aligned to specific political parties. I know like in Jamaica, it's, it's strong, like, it's strong, uh, but it's also strong in the EC countries, St. Vincent, um, St. Lucia, in terms of trade unions that are supportive of the St. Lucia Labour Party. Antigua, oh, Antigua is very strong. Um, and you know, the re let me just give a little historical background why that is so though. That is also, that is so because of how the, the, pol the, the because trade unions played such a powerful role in the political evolution of those societies, they became intertwined with political parties, um, which is kind of unfortunate because the, the, when you look at the main political parties in some of the countries, they, they, ideologically, they're the same, really, right? They just have different names, but they're the same ideologically. But their program is the same, right? Neoliberalism. Um, so that is so that those are internal divisions that has to be overcome. I fully agree with you. And these are things that we've had to contend with. And I have to tell you, it's probably if if you were to ask me and my stress level, which one causes the most stress is dealing with, with these divisions. <laughs> more more, <laughs> more than dealing with um, other things. But all right. Um the other question of the role of trade union leadership, yeah, you're correct in that um, there are, I, I spoke of the radical Caribbean tradition, but not everyone is in line with that. And this is why I said as a political option, it is, and I guess I can say it here, 
the radicalization of the Cipriani College of Labor. That has to become a progressive. That cannot be a, just another, it cannot be just another educational institution. That has to be the space, because I'll tell you, um, it is where shop stewards, people on the ground, the workers on the ground, they end up there. They study in, they're doing 10, um, 10 courses. And why, why I say that particular college, unlike the universities, you could just be an ordinary worker, right? Join their 10 Saturday class and move and work your way up. You don't have to have any qualifications, right? So one of the things that we are trying to do is to send more and more of our own radical shop stewards. The, the, those are the rank and file officers who, who you know, engage in day-to-day in -day confrontation and battle, who are not afraid to challenge the status quo and have them be more involved in the college. Because you know, at that college, we had complaints that lecturers were spewing anti-union sentiments. They were they had difficulties with strike action and all of these kind of things. So we recognize that we have some work to do with the Institute, but at least we're working on it, which leads me to the third point, the technical capacity. I think that's also the space where that can happen. Um, I do not, I will not even venture to suggest the, um, the University of the West Indies. I think it's too bourgeoisified at the moment. So at least we have a college that we could kind of groom and, uh, provide that sort of technical capacity, but also we have joined forces with like, for example, the Global Labor University um, to uh, to provide some of that technical support and why particularly them, the the, the people there are progressive. Um, they're not what you'll call um, moderate trade unionists. They are on, from the progressive radical side. So that will be uh, useful. Understanding that um, every court matter or every matter that goes before the ministry is a battleground of class struggle. It's not, you know, just um, uh, it's 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 not just this kind of legal. Like if, in other words, the trade unions cannot become a lawful, <laughs> right? That's not really. <laughs> so yeah. yeah, I think that thing that I think that covered your very difficult question <laughs> thank you it, it, i said it with um <laughs> it's certain it feels raw for me because we've just been on multiple years of strikes and culminating in a marking boycott and then having the the rug pulled out from under us yeah. by the union lead by our general secretary and so that the, the question of union mm. leadership is kind of <laughs> raw for me yeah <laughs> right thank you very much now the last question we're going to have back to my uh, and then I think we've worked Aussie very hard. He did complain that we were. That, that, that we I, were I thoroughly, en I thoroughly enjoyed it, Steve. I, I really, did, really loved it. We did complain that we were bad pupils. I would like to think that hard work keeps you young. So <laughs> you <laughs> now you raised the point of, and, and to quote you, educating and sensitizing the masses. I've got three books I'm looking at here. Mm -hmm. And you talked about, you know, knowledge of Walter and others, you know, being very, very minimal. First is Kimani Nehusi, People's History, a People's Political History of Guyana, 1838 to 1964. Oh, yes, that's, that's right? a good one. Yeah, yes. Now, I don't know whether this is generally available in Guyana, if not the rest of the Caribbean, right? Clem Citran has just produced a book wonderful book and it's actually factually quoting from Chedi Jagan's own yeah mm -hmm. correspondence Chedi Jagan and the Cold War 1946 to 1990 oh, yes. right mm -hmm. the third, because you mentioned that our movements have always been socialist is Winston James Claude Mackay the making of a black Bolshevik ah yes right now I am saying to myself where do our communities in the Caribbean region access yeah, mm -hmm. this kind of information yeah. on a regular basis? Because Walter introduced groundings, and I yes. don't have groundings now. Yeah. Second point I want to raise, and it's about this issue about capital confronting labor. Capital is able to continue abusing, in my opinion, I want your opinion, is able to continue abusing labor because they have 
this what they call safety net of the remittance economy. Mm. And it is established mm. that the remittance mm. economy is greater mm. than all of the donations that come from outside countries into mm. places like the Caribbean and definitely Africa. Now, there is nobody in the Caribbean yeah, who is poor and powerless who does not depend on that remittance economies because we are fleeing the region as fast as we can if we're able to, to get into the North Americas and the other places for a higher wage because our wages are depressed to this day. Uh, thank you. Right. Uh, as I say, I think we've worked Aussie hard enough. Uh, so <laughs> if, you would care to, uh, if you would care to answer that, it's just, it's uh, and, 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 and make any uh, any final uh, final remarks that you wish to make uh, uh, at the end, which uh, it's always the privilege of the speaker that if there's something you want to say without fear of contradiction, you can do. <laughs> uh, and uh, there's just one thing: uh, uh, Carol did ask uh, about any relationships you have with uh, 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 British trade unions. Oh. Um. Oh. Directly, I would have to say no, no, not not directly. Um, I mean, I think uh, you and I were talking about it, Steve. Uh, in particular, I remember you were mentioning the RMT. So I do think that that is because it was interesting, Carol, you raised that because in the talk, and I was deliberate when I said it, that the Trinidad Workers in the early days, the early labor organizations in the Caribbean were very close to, to to the British working class organizations, eh? They were like literally were like, you know, hand in glove. So I do think that that, that is an area that re, that is worth exploring to strengthen the, the ties and the links. Uh, especially if we have to confront capital, really have to try to see if we could do it, you know, as much as possible with solidarity, with as much solidarity as we can. Um but I Ray raised a really interesting point, and it'd be, I mean, it'd be interesting to see an analysis because we talk a lot about the plantation economy, but the remittance economy, um, and the role that that has played. Because what in fact it did, it, it, in other words, if my pay was or, or if I didn't work at all, period, um. I still got this remit. I became dependent on the remittance, and therefore it may have had a sort of nullifying effect to fight. Um, so that is just something that is worth thinking about. I've not thought about it. I'm not going to say that I have. I haven't. Um, I, I do think it's worth thinking a, a lot about in terms of that the role that it has played. It's in 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 this in this era um so to, should i close uh, yeah yes yeah yeah the floor <laughs> is yours say what you like <laughs> um well what i would like to state is that we are, the world is in a very interesting juncture very very interesting when you consider the climate crisis the crisis of war uh, when you consider the, the the politics of hate and division, it's like human society is at this fragile moment. But I also think that it was similar moments in at the beginning of 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 capital, where you know people like Marx and Engels and and the rest of them, you know, attempted to revision how human society should be organized. I believe that that is where we are. We have to now, having gone through the crisis of capitalism, seeing the failure of neoliberalism, seeing what the cost it has, it has placed on, on this one planet that we have. I mean, in terms of the possibility of it not being habitable for us. I think it is that moment where we have to re-envision or re-imagine how to organize human society. I therefore believe that there is now a prime opportunity for progressive movement and the progressive forces 
to make a move. Unfortunately, it's not just us. It, there will are other forces, right-wing forces, um, extreme fascist forces that are also seeing that same opportunity. And I, I just want to, I am encouraged to continue to engage in the struggle uh, with ordinary working people. I, I believe that the Caribbean working class have a big role to play as the, we have played that role before, a big role to play in that in reimagination of how we organize human society. So I just want to take this opportunity to thank you all for giving me the opportunity to share and to ramble a bit. <laughs> thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Ozzy. That was uh, that was excellent. And if, uh, 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 some some very complimentary remarks in the chat and uh, 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 and so on. So uh, thank everybody for attending. Uh, there'll be uh, 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 we haven't actually got the summer terms uh, uh, seminars sorted yet, so I can't announce the next one. But uh, uh, I'll make sure that uh, as many of you as possible are informed of future seminars. Uh, and you're always uh, uh, and you and you'll always be welcome to come. So thank you very much for attending, and uh, see you uh, next time whenever that is. Bye bye all. Thanks, Steve. Mm. Thanks, Lodi. Okay. All right. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you all for having me. Thank you. Do you save chat, Steve? Yeah. Ah, oh, good, because there's a, a comment or oh, a little bit for Aussie in the chat. Thanks right. a lot. Okay. Yeah, no, Excellent. It, it saves itself automatically. Great, <laughs> thanks. Cheerio, have a good evening. Oh.